Thank you so much, the seven singers, for the beautiful music. I'm amazed to see how God has placed gifts in every single ethnic group. Those that are present in our church and uh, those that are not. When I first came to the United States, I was ready to learn some of the foundational terms and concepts of Seventh-day Adventism in America. I had already known how important Happy Sabbath was. I knew that was uh, the most important greeting in a church setting, so important that it can happen for somebody to greet the pastor with Happy Sabbath even on a Monday. Happy Sabbath, pastor. Happy Monday. Well, one of the things that I did not know and I had to learn is uh, the concept of potluck. I knew what pot is. I knew what luck is. But luck in a pot? What is that? Pot is something you want to put something in. But how are you going to put luck in a pot? So I was told that actually potluck is when uh, people want to eat together and they all bring their own pot. And then you take a plate and you go around and uh, according to the desires of your palate, you will try to prepare your own haystack. Well, uh, that's another concept. Haystack? Huh. Okay, so what is hay? I knew what haystack was. I grew up out in the country. I know exactly what that is, so... In America, at a potluck, they eat haystack. Uh, yeah, haystack is made to be eaten by cows. <laughs> but how are humans going to eat haystack? How vegetarian do they have to be to eat haystack? But then I was told that you go around and uh, you place one l layer of uh, chips tortilla chips, and then you put beans on it, and then you sprinkle some shredded vegetarian, vegan cheese, and then you go on uh, with a generous amount of chopped lettuce, that's important, and then you toss some uh, cucumbers, some uh, tomatoes, so what, what else? Ani a salsa, immediately salsa. <laughs> Wait for the salsa. Salsa, salsa comes after onion, uh, and uh, you put some guacamole, okay, first, uh, and uh, sour cream, mm, sour cream, some seeds, okay. Uh, beans, we passed beans long ago. <laughs> and yeah, then, La salsita, senora. Okay. Then the salsa. And mm, that's yummy. Some say. I don't know. <laughs> that's not, my, not the favorite of my wife, I would say. But the potluck you put up for our welcome was amazing. Thank you so much. But speaking about haystack... Isn't what life is similar to a haystack? Layer upon layer upon layer from the time of your conception all the way to the time when you grow old. Layer upon layer, thing upon thing. Come with me to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 1. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 4 and 5 on one side, and then 
16 and 17 on the other side of the heel. Right? This is a chiastic structure. That's why we are taking one passage from one side and one from the other side. It's a Hebrew chiastic parallelism. So this is what it says in John chapter 1. Verses five, 4 and 5. In him, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. Or some translations have it overcome it. Then verses 16 and 17. And of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. There are other translations that say grace after grace or grace upon grace. Yes, of his fullness, we have all received and grace after grace. And then verse 17 says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are here to look at life from the perspective of your life brought to us through Jesus Christ, the life. May the Holy Spirit Bring us to life in your name, through your grace. Amen. In uh, June, on June 26, June 26, 2000, in a major media event at the White House, Francis Collins the famous American physician gen geneticist, the one that led the Human Genome Project, said the following words. What more powerful Yes, that's it. It is humbling for me and awe-inspiring to realize that we have cut the first glimpse of our own instruction book, previously known only to God. Instruction book, previously known only to God. Then he asked the question. The question, yes, what more powerful form of study of mankind could there be then to read our own instruction book? He was talking about the DNA, the human genome. And then he goes on, and now he's becoming quite controversial, especially to some of the scientific circles. He says, it is humbling for me and awe-inspiring to realize that we have caught the first glimpse of our own instruction book, previously only known to God. Bill Clinton, the one that was the president of the United States at that time, he wanted to say something to praise the scientists that were involved. And uh, this is what he said. Today we are learning that the language in which God created life, we are gaining ever more awe for the complexity, the beauty, the wonder of God's most divine and sacred gift. Hmm, interesting from a politician. Next year, that's 2001, same year when 9-11 happened. This is what Francis Collins said 
at a press conference with regard to the same project, the Human Genome Project. But we are also profoundly humbled by the privilege of turning the pages that describe the miracle of human life, written in the mysterious language of all the ages, the language of God. This is a scientist who also wrote a book by the same title, The Language of God. But then in 2009, another scientist, his name is Stephen Meyer, who holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge in the philosophy of science. He wrote the book, Signature in the Cell, DNA and the Evidence for Intelligent Design. Signature in the Cell. His point is, basically, that because your DNA carries the information of life, it's the very essence of life, Therefore, the mystery of the origins of life, the core of that mystery, is in fact the origin of information. How did the first information appear that was necessary to get life going? And he has an answer for that. There is no information without an intelligent source. And... Uh, if you have information, if the cell has information, if the DNA contains information, there must be an intelligent designer behind the genome, behind the DNA. Those are scientists. Those people do not necessarily believe the Bible in everything the Bible says. But I want to make two observations. First observation is that even if many scientists don't want to hear about God and creation, there are still other scientists that have a hard time not to take in account in this equation of life that there must be some sort of an intelligent source, an intelligent designer an intelligent creator behind life. And uh, it's interesting how these concepts of language of God, instruction book written by God, or signature in the cell, how close these concepts are from the biblical description of the creator called Logos. In the beginning, was the Word, the Logos. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. So God is before all creation. Jesus Christ being God, He is before all creation. When was God born? My six-year-old asked me the other day, huh, God was never born? God is God because he was never born. God is before every creation. He is not created. He has no beginning and no end. Jesus Christ, in his humanity, he was born. At one point in history, but in his divinity, he was never born. And then the passage goes on, and verse 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of man. Yes, in him, in Jesus Christ, was life. He's the source of life. And that life came and was the light of man. The picture, the imagery, is the imagery of the pillar of fire that led the people of Israel through the desert during the night, during the darkness of the night. 
and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness, darkness did not comprehend it or did not overcome it, some other translations say. Both translations are correct. A good word in English to translate the Hebrew verb katalambano would be master, to master. Because master has both meanings. To grasp it, to understand, to comprehend something. Like the student is mastering or can master his class or her class, right? And it also has the idea of mastering. When somebody masters his or her enemy. Both are true for the light. Darkness cannot comprehend light, cannot understand it. That's a possible explanation as to why so many people, wise people, intelligent people, scientists, they just don't, don't get it. And then darkness cannot overcome light. But I have a second observation. It's more like a question. If there is a source for life, an intelligent source, an intelligent designer, somebody that has life in himself, somebody that was not killed because they could kill him, he was killed because he allowed himself to be killed. And that's totally different. If that is true, then, then how is it that from that source of life, of eternal life, such a haste that came out, like my life, like your life? And I'm speaking here about the ephemeral nature of life. The fleeting, the passing, the transient nature of life. It has preoccupied my life, my mind, ever since I was a child. I was a child and at the age of four, I went to the funeral of my pre-K teacher's daughter, two years old. Zita, she died. And... Uh, I can tell you, when I saw the grave swallowing up the little casket in which I knew Zita was sleeping, I knew something was wrong about this life. Then, as every child that was born and grew up in a Christian home, I got to learn the golden text of the Bible. You know what that is. The golden text of the Bible, for God so loved the world. Beautiful passage. And when I would repeat that passage, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that, so that what? Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting... Oh, so... So even if our haystack is so transient, there's still a chance because Christ brought eternal life. But this is how I would understand that. Okay, so I'm leaving this life, this earthly life, this fleeting, this flimsy life, and then I grow old. And uh, then I die. And then the day of resurrection comes. And I'll, I'm brought back to life. And then from that point on is what? Eternal life. I was about 20, which was 20 years ago. When... Because I was studying, studying uh, theology and uh, I was looking for a topic for my dissertation, uh, BA in theology, I asked myself, okay, so what is, what is the topic that really interests you? And I came to the conclusion that 
that what really is of interest for me is the topic, the, the, the issue, the big theme of life and death. So I started studying the concept of eternal life in the Bible, especially in the Gospel of John. And to my surprise, I discovered something, that eternal life is not only in the future. Eternal life is already. And uh, you may think, okay, so, so how, how can that be? Well, yes. Somebody that accepted Jesus Christ already has eternal life. And I, I wrote down my findings in this dissertation. If anybody wants to read it, you can. You just have to learn Romanian first. <laughs> but if you, if you have doubts, because you may have doubts, then look at this Bible verse. John chapter 5, verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me, what is that? Has everlasting life. And if you think, okay, this is about having everlasting life in the future. You get it now, but you will really have it in the future. No, no, no. And shall not come into judgment, but what? Has passed from death into life. That is amazing, I would say. So, am I, am I living now that eternal life? Has passed from death into life. You know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you will never die. Let's clarify this. Some of you may die one day. Some of you, if Jesus comes early enough, may not die. But here's the thing. Death is called asleep. Not because it's not real. I'm positive when my grandma died, the only grandma I got to know, I was seven at that time. And she had seven grandchildren, and we surrounded the coffin, and we shouted and cried because grandma was sleeping too long. I think if she was not dead, she, if, she, if, if she had not been dead, she would have woken up. She was as dead as dead can be. But here is the thing. Somebody that lives eternal life already, never dies in a sense, and that's what Jesus says in John chapter 11, because they have somebody to whom death is just asleep. We cannot do anything about it, really. But for Jesus Christ, who says, I am the resurrection and the life, for him is just a word. For the word... Undoing death is just a word. He can say, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes out. It's like somebody that has, has a finger strong enough to push the hold button. And when he decides, he releases the button. And life goes on from the exact point where it was stopped. That's why we don't believe, based on the Bible, that when somebody dies, they don't really die. No, death is real. But as real as death is, the resurrection and the life is even more real in Jesus Christ. So now you may think, okay, so how does this help me in the 21st century where we are confronted with death at every single step? I don't know if you know that right now some people are speaking about coronavirus variants that are 10 times stronger 
than the Delta variant that we are dealing with right now. I don't know what that even means. But one thing I know, this pandemic has shown that life is fragile, it's frangible, it's friable, it's frail, it's fleeting, and you can go on and on. It's been 20 years now, 20 years, since our sense of uh, safety and security has gone, and with it, the sense of privacy too. Terrorism, or let's call it something else, weapons, nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons, those are all threats to human life, to the little haystack, layer upon layer. And people fear for their little haystack, don't they? Climate change, global warming. And uh, some scientists say we are heading toward a global catastrophe, cataclysm, calamity. I'm waiting for the report of uh, COP26. It's going to come out in October sometime. But I, I can see what lack of hope and uh, sober report they will bring. Then people are talking about a cyber attack, an imminent cyber, major cyber attack, as a result of the technology and connectivity that exists in our world today, the entire World Wide Web may collapse. Can you just imagine what that means? And to say one more, you know that people are talking about AI. What is AI? Artificial intelligence. And they say that pretty soon, AI will take life over, and humans, as you know them today, will be somehow taken out from the equation of life, from the story of life. Jobs will be lost. The rich will become richer. The poor will become poorer. And yes, many people fear for their life because of the threats, because of the scarcity, because of the lack of everything that is at the horizon. Is there any solution? Yes, there is solution for the one that knows God through Jesus Christ. Because this is eternal life, says Jesus in John chapter 17, verse 3. That they will know you and the one you sent, Jesus Christ. And this is where the solution is. John chapter 1, verse 16 and then 17. And of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. Grace after grace. Grace upon grace. And then John goes on explaining what this means. And he says, for the law was given to Moses, but in the Greek language, but is not there. And the NIV has it right. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And law came through Moses. Well, to understand that first, you have to take into account that there is no but in between. Meaning that those two concepts, grace and truth, are not mutually exclusive as many people believe in Christianity. But let's see in the Old Testament what was the law given from God through Moses good for. This is what it says, Deuteronomy chapter one, verse, 4, verse 1. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgment, judgments which I teach you to observe. Why? 
that you may what? Live. Deuteronomy 5.33 You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you. Why? That you may live. 8.1 Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe. Why? That you may live. Ezekiel 20 verse 11 and I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. Have you seen the motive of life coming back again and again? Jesus said, I have come so that they will have life and they will have it to the full or to the fullest. Because the role of the law is to prevent harm, is to prevent suffering, is to prevent sin. The role of the law is for somebody to have the chance to live life to the full, to the fullest. But then, when somebody sins, when the harm has happened, when uh, the pain is already there, you don't need the law first or the truth because the law and the truth are synonymous in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. You need something else. What is that? Grace, exactly. Because grace is there for you to be reestablished, to be healed. But once grace comes into your life, you again need what? Truth. Is it difficult? No. But can you see how that's exactly how life works? Because the previous verse says, verse 16, and we have received from his fullness, of his fullness, we have all received. So from God's fullness, fullness of life, we have all received. And grace after grace, grace upon grace. I don't know if you were, you were aware of the fact that Hebrew thinking and Greek thinking are two different realities. In Hebrew thinking, you walk through life differently from Greek thinking. In the way of the Greek philo philosophers, you and I were thought that we are heading toward the future, right? You are heading toward the future, your face to the future. And your past is where? Your past is behind you. Is that the picture you're getting? Everywhere it's taught. But in fact, in Hebrew thinking, it's the other way around. In Hebrew thinking, you have your past in front of you. And you walk, so to speak, backwards to the future. You don't know the future. But what you know is the past. And when you look at your past, which is in front of you, you see the past, you know the past. You are walking toward the future. You don't know the future. You only know the future to the prophecy that God reveals his people, the events that are coming. But you are walking backwards, backwards to the future, and you see the past and what do you see in the past? You see grace after grace, grace after grace, grace upon grace, grace upon grace. Let me come back to the haystack. Haymaking is no easy, easy job. If somebody thinks that's uh, the delight of the farmers, no, it's, it's a difficult job. At least it was when I was a child. Haymaking means that you first have to do the haycocks out in the field. I don't know if you know what a haycock is. Maybe we can have the picture on screen for that. Okay, that's a haycock, right? So then when you have uh, maybe hundreds of haycocks, you come uh, with a cart pulled by oxen or cows or horses or with a tractor that pulls a trailer, and you have to carry all those haycocks to the household. 
And there you build what is called a haystack. Now, building a haystack is a very difficult work. Why? Because the hay has to be stacked one fork load after the other like this. Fork load upon fork load. Usually I would be on top of the haystack and my father would give me one fork load after the other. One upon the other. But one year, we had another guy help us because we had a lot of hay. So I was on the top there and both of them were giving me the loads of hay. And that was a huge difference between the two guys. My father was very careful and he would try to put the load exactly where it was needed so that it will be even. The other guy had very strong muscle fiber, but his brain fiber was not as strong as his muscle fiber. So he wouldn't care. He would just take the load and throw it up in the air and wherever it falls, praise the Lord, it didn't stay up in the air. And now, I was supposed to deal with it. Sometimes it was so difficult that um, even willingly I would push it down back. So my father can take it and put it to the right place. Sometimes I would do that by mistake. But even my father would do mistakes, would make mistakes sometime. Interestingly enough, with all the collaboration we would have, at one point the haystack would be so big, so tall, that I could hardly see what is going on down there. And from afar I would be almost invisible because you being small, short, right? And uh, hay being fluffy, you, 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 you sink in the hay and they don't even know you're there. But I have a question for you. Who is really building the haystack? My answer would be, I'm building it because I'm on top of it. I take care of every load to be placed the right way. My father could have said, no, no, I'm building it because I give you load after load, put it in the right place. The other guy could have come and said, hey, listen, even if uh, I'm not uh, the best when it comes to placing the load of hay to the right place, I'm strong and I'm giving it to you. Who builds the haystack. See, out of his fullness, we all received. And, says John, grace after grace. Because was it your fullness? Who made the hay? Who made the hay, the, the grass grow? Who made the hay dry? Who gave the, phys- gave the physical power to bring the hay home? Who gave you wisdom not to fall from the hay stack? You know, it's so easy, and that's where humanity is today, to look around from the height of your haystack. I don't know how tall your haystack is, but it's so tempting to be looking around and say, ha <clears throat> ha. See what I built? And you become dizzy and you come tumbling down. And that's life. That's where humanity is. And that's where sometimes we in our private life go. I can tell you, I can confess, whenever I have the impression I built it, I become dizzy and I fall. I come tumbling down. And the good, gracious Lord, he comes with grace and, and heals me first. And then he helps me rebuild out of his fullness. I don't know where your life is right now. Some of you may feel like my haystack is gone. It's just gone. I don't even know if I have power to rebuild it. 
And the good Lord graciously looks at you and says, Hey, don't worry about the future. I'm there already. I don't know how you feel about the next segment of your life. Your segment that you thought is in front of you, out of a sudden you realize it's not in front of you because you're walking backwards. But somebody is there already for you. And on a day when we remember how life has become fragile and frangible and friable, we can remember that somebody has a fullness and has grace upon grace, and we can rely on him. And if you believe you have no power to rebuild, or you are afraid that you may lose the haystack or the haycock, remember what he said. He told one of the greatest heroes of faith, he told him, my grace, my grace is sufficient. Amen.